The actress Diane Keaton said that motherhood is the most completely humbling experience I've ever had. It puts you in your place because it really forces you to address the issues you claim to believe in. Welcome to The Manifesto, the podcast that looks how parenting and politics combine. This week on The Manifesto, I'm delighted to welcome Liana Bird. Liana is a mum of two, a radio DJ, filmmaker, writer and the co-founder of the charity Choose Love. She's currently working on a campaign to ensure that childhoods are smartphone free. Liana, welcome to the Manifesto. I want to start with uh, what happened to you before you became a parent, because I feel frankly like I'm talking to the cool kid on the bus because you were <laughs> you were an indie DJ, which is like my life and my ambition. I couldn't be you because I could never be as cool as you. But you're also working in an environment that's incredibly male dominated. So just tell us a little bit to start with about kind of life before becoming a mum. Gosh, um, yes, that did exist. I have to remind myself that that even happened. Um, I'm I'm like dreaming about that world for you. (laughs) (laughs) Distant memories way, way back in the back of my mind. Um, So, yeah, I worked as a radio DJ um, across a variety of radio stations, but predominantly for what was known as XFM. Um, and then became Radio X as it is today. So I did that for 16 years. I believe I was the longest standing female DJ on the X, um, which was, yeah, it was an amazing thing to do. And, you know, through that, I DJed festivals globally. I hosted some amazing events, met some amazing people and got to interview like a hell of a lot of my heroes, which is always, you know, just such a kind of surreal moment when you're there and you're interviewing the people whose music you grew up to and you love so much. So I was incredibly blessed and I love my time that I had doing that. Um, I've always been a little bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, but who said that Jack wasn't having more fun? Um, So I've always done a lot of other things alongside it. And actually, because my radio shows were mostly Saturday and Sundays, it left me the rest of the week to play shall we say and um and do other work and you know i've done so many things you know pre-kids when you have this like free time you're like what am i actually gonna do so from putting on theatrical productions writing books um science podcasts i had a science book out and i really just i had a lot of fun doing a lot of things and obviously um a lot of work within the activism space as well um co-founding what is now known as choose love and was a massive part of my journey as well um but yeah i really i really just kind of was in a privileged position which i'm so grateful for of getting to do this beautiful music show on the weekends, travel the world, meet all these amazing people, live this kind of really rock and roll life, and then have my weeks to kind of hunker down and think about what else I wanted to do. So, um, yeah, see, I, I'm uh, talking about I, it now, but I can't believe I got to do that. And that was an actual job. What am I? It's incredible. <laughs> and I also think of the, the point. So one thing that's been really troubling me recently is how do I explain to my kids what I did before they existed and not sound like a real weirdo? It's like I went and I sat in lots of long, boring meetings and then I did a leaflets and I stuffed envelopes. And, you know, the comparison Stella, you, in you terms of how you get, to, you, know, you get no, to talk no. to about what you did. No, you, you see, you have, you I see that. Yet, it's your children. Yet. Have you ever talked to them about being in that world? No. But you see, I feel I, like I, you've got... You've got this backwards, Stella. You can be, I can be like, yeah, mummy played some songs on the radio. And you can be like, your mum's changed the world. She's out there fighting for rights and she's literally changing the world. Come on, give yourself more credence. I can absolutely promise you already at the age of four, my daughter is distinctly unimpressed with what I do. She calls it the boring stuff. Are you going to go and do boring (laughs) stuff, mummy? I wish I could tell her that I was going to go and play some music on the radio and like go and hang out with rock stars and generally you know be creative rather than so, sitting in boring meetings so when i had my kids that's when i also had to rethink about my life and the juggle that i was doing you know i was doing saturday and sundays on the radio I was doing um, what was Help Refugees and Choose Love during the week. I was writing books. I was doing podcasts. It was really overwhelming. I actually got quite sick. Um, I developed an autoimmune condition, which, you know, you never know with these things exactly what the trigger is, but it did coincide with a time of extreme stress and overwork and pressure. So I had to take a bit of a look at my own life and the balance of my own life and my own priorities and figure out, you know, what I wanted to keep doing and how much I wanted to keep my foot so firmly down on the pedal. And I did make a lot of changes off the back of that, you know, getting ill or having another defining event 
like that can really put things into focus for you and just force you almost to to, to make some decisions um, that possibly you needed to make anyway. So, you know, I did restructure my life a lot and I, I took a huge step back. I, I, I stopped my work with Choose Love. I, I eventually have left the world of radio. I mean, I, you know, I may well go back into it at some point, but I decided I really wanted my weekends back because there's only so many times you can miss kids' birthday parties and friends' weddings. And, you know, I basically gave up my weekends for 16 years and I'm not complaining because it was a wonderful lifestyle and, you know, lucky me working weekends and then having the week freeze. But, you know, there is always a, a cost to everything. And when, once you have kids, you just really want to have that precious time, especially when they start school with them. So I, I, I shifted my priorities and I really refocused on, on writing kids books, which is such a massive passion of mine. And um, so my kids don't know me as a radio DJ because <laughs> I must have been about three when my my oldest must have been about three when I stopped doing that. And although she does remember a little bit of me giving her shout outs on a Sunday evening at bedtime <laughs> and going, go to bed, Dolly. Uh, and I, I used to literally on the radio be like, why are you still up? <laughs> because then that, my husband would be texting me going, they're still up. And I'd be like, go to bed. But, um, but in her head, I'm a children's author. And that's how she sees me. And she's, she's really, you know, my, my kids love that. And they come to my book readings and I go into oh, wow. their schools and nurseries. And so that's, that's how they see mummy. So they don't know this, this festival DJ rock and roll life that I had at all. But you see, I just, I have that moment where I think when, you know, when they're teenage, your kids are just gonna be like, wow, an added layer of coolness, where it's like, when my kids are teenage, they're gonna be like, seriously, mum, you spent hours in meetings talking about points of order. Come on, how boring and nerdy are you? Well, I think my kids will probably be, they might be like, well, why did you leave that? And I'll be like, well, it was for you. Like I did it for <laughs> you really. Um, but I also, do you know what? I also think, you know, in my twenties, you know, being a music DJ, going to festivals, interviewing bands felt like the coolest job in the world. And, you know, I'm in my forties now and think, I'm not saying it's not a cool job and like all respect to people who carry on doing it, you know, through the decades. And I think it's an amazing space to be in. But for me, you know, things shifted. And I actually think like the coolest thing in the world now is to create your own things, right? So I'm all about creating books or creating um, theatre or, you know, creating laws, um, you know, <laughs> having a real impact in the world in a slightly different way i think it's all valid i know i'm in a really privileged position as well where i am able to shift my career a little bit here and there because i have you know the financial support of a, mm. of a, of a really supportive partner i know that that's like lucky me I'm, I'm fully aware of that but i also think you know i want to encourage my children to see the world slightly differently than I did, that all the glitters is not gold. And actually, you know, you could be a gardener making uh, some flowers look beautiful. You could be a plumber making someone's plumbing work. Like if you're creating and making something that is just as cool, if not cooler, as interviewing rock stars. I don't know how that's going to go down, but that's what I'm going to try. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think you hit on two points, which is one, there comes a point for all of us. You know, I remember when I was talking to a member of staff who didn't know who David Bowie was, and I was like, okay, I'm out. I'm out because because I can't even begin to explain who musical genius. But also the the transition from perhaps being somebody, especially in say an environment that's very male dominated, fighting to make your mark, get your platform, be in the position that you were in, and to have that ability to shape your life, to then suddenly the difference and the disjunction that comes when you do have kids and you suddenly think my priorities do have to shift, and actually the environment I'm in isn't shifting to match that, and that's really frustrating because. You want to be creative, but you also, like you say, you don't want to burn out like you. I also got very ill during pregnancy and it is a real wake up call that there's a kind of limit to what you're capable of. And I think often for women, that's a, that's a really shocking moment because we fought so hard to, to get those platforms in those spaces. And then suddenly yeah. something else comes on that's just as important to us. But but there's a there's a barrier there. And I think there's been a real disconnect in terms of the way that women's mindset ha mindsets have changed and the messaging that we're getting, you know, young women are getting saying, you know, you can do everything, you can go out there, you can change the world, you can have this job, da, 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 da. and that is a brilliant message. But if we don't at the same time focus on how the systems can change to support that, you're just creating a generation of women who are absolutely burnt out because it's not about having it all, it's suddenly about doing it all. You know, if we don't also teach our young men that they need to be much more active in terms of you know the household and the comms with schools and you know the if they do have children you know medical care and vaccines you know all this kind of 
uh, invisible load, I think is the, is the term for it, you know, the invisible load that women carry and in the workplace as well, really understanding and supporting, you know, the challenges that women uniquely face if they become parents in particular, um, then all you're doing is you're just going to keep piling more and more and more into women who feel like if they're not doing it all, then they're failing somehow. You know, if they're staying at home to raise kids, well then, you know, or they're not being ambitious enough, which is absolute BS. Or if they are going out and prioritizing a career and doing really well, but they haven't got kids, then they're missing out, which again, you know, it's just such a terrible pressure that we put on women. And if we're going to encourage women to have it all, which I would say society benefits from hugely having women involved in all aspects of our, of our lives and policies and the work that's going on, you know, what a great gift to society to have, you know, half the population contributing, but we have to support that and help them and put systems in place and, and have a shift in the, in the load that we just assume that mothers and women will take on. Um, they have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, you know, people getting sick, people getting burnt out, people getting mental health issues is just going to rocket, in my opinion. I think of it as the Barbie fallacy because we built this whole ethos and the, the Barbie film tells it, you know, we want women to feel they can do anything, but it's always always like one woman on her own. And it's never actually that the environment that she's going into, we don't, we don't see the Barbie dream house changing. We see Barbie changing things and that's a huge amount of pressure, but just talk us yeah. through what it was like to make that transition from um, to, into, into motherhood and what impact that had on your, you, so we talked about they having to rethink your priorities you were yeah. working as a DJ at the time. What was that like? Did you feel that people treated you differently? Look, I think, you know, though I was very much like many other kind of ambitious young people. And I was very much just on this train of, you know, pushing, pushing more and more. And what does success look like? Well, success looks like visibility, you know, getting the biggest show, getting the best show, having the most listeners, um, money, you know, how much are you able to earn? How much are you able to promote yourself? How, you know, this kind of like these metrics of success were very kind of traditional, I suppose, you know, how, are you going to get promoted? And am I going to have a book? And, you know, all these things which are incredibly valid, and they're great, and they make you feel good, of course. But I think the shift that happened when I had children, for me personally, and especially going through an illness as well, was that suddenly success looked a little bit different to me. So success to me became about, am I having a balanced life? Do I feel calm inside? Am I feeling fulfilled in all aspects of my life, not just my career? And again, that ability to do that comes from a privilege, right? Because most women and most people can't say, oh, well, I'm going to prioritize self-care and that. They have to work to pay the bills. They have to support their kids. Mm -hmm. They are struggling to keep their heads above water. In my privileged position that I was, I was able to shift what I see as success. So to, for me today, you know, part of success is raising happy children, right? And I'm not saying that, you know, when you have kids, you, it suddenly becomes all about, you know, being a mom and that you should no longer think about yourself, but it's just, there's this, there's a much more nuanced balanced approach I, I take to it. And sometimes opportunities come, which I would never have dreamt of turning down before. And I will say no, and that's okay. And I feel really at peace with that because it allows me to do something else, which is either for me or for my family or for my kids. And I think I just, it's just that kind of shift in mentality that I had personally. Um, in terms of, you know, leaving radio, it wasn't an easy decision. Um, you know, there were, I felt some issues in terms of me as a woman on air working in a very male dominated um, environment. And particularly from my understanding, I was the first woman who got pregnant and had a baby whilst working on air at that particular station. And I felt like certainly I would have liked to have better communication and for them to have used me as a kind of case study to help create a blueprint of how to support women who are in public facing roles in particular to be able to parent and especially with a newborn baby, you know, to breastfeed and all those kinds of questions that you 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 get suddenly get, get met with as a new parent, all these decisions you have to make. But whilst also, but not not feeling I had to choose between that and my career. And I definitely feel like lessons could be learned from that. And I wish I'd been a bit more of a part of the conversation because I think when you're having decisions about these things made by a male dominated group of leaders, it's not a lack of care all the time. Sometimes it's just 
a lack of experience of the female experience of going through giving birth and having kids. And if you don't include women in those decision making moments and in those conversations, how on earth are you supposed to navigate it? Right. And so I think definitely looking back, things could have been managed a little bit differently. But saying that I have nothing but love for my time there. I had such a great time. I feel so privileged to have done that job for as long as I did. And I do think that for me anyway, it was time for a new chapter. And it's op allowed me to open other doors since then. So yeah, mixed feelings about how I left, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I, th I, think, I think your story reflects something that a lot of women will connect with, which is that it's very often when they announce their pregnancies that workplaces kind of go, oh gosh, we're gonna have to do something about this. As though pregnancy and childbirth and having babies is an unexpected, surprising thing to happen in the world. Um, certainly that was my experience in, in Parliament and still too in Parliament, we're trying to figure out what on earth you do if these things called MPs have babies. And yet you think, well, that isn't a surprise in the world in general, is it? And actually, you know, we legislate around these areas, but we don't even follow the rules ourselves in Parliament for the rules that we yeah. make. And um, one of the things for you, obviously, you were self-employed and particularly mm -hmm. for women who are self-employed, there are real challenges. Um, and it is the women because the system still very much separates you as, a, as, as an employer of yourself. Um, just talk yeah. us through your experience of that. Well, this is what I was actually going to say. This was what was, you know, my experience as a, as a, a freelancer. So I, although I worked at the station 16 years, you know, I was self-employed. Um, and there are fantastic benefits that come for that with that, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to taking um, maternity leave, so to speak, you know, you're not going to get paid maternity leave in the same way you would if you work for a company. So I think that there is a balance between when you're self-employed and you're being told, well, take as long as you like on maternity leave. You know, we're really supportive of your journey, which on the one hand is, a, you know, feels like a generous thing to say. You take as long as you need. But on the other hand, this is unpaid leave. And actually the conversation should be, how long do you want to take off? Can And can we facilitate you if you want to return to work earlier? How can we make that work for you that doesn't contradict what you need to do for your newborn, you know, and in particular, I'm talking about breastfeeding, which as we know, has very specific timing needs around it, right? But I think that's the challenge here, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about um, all the ins and outs and all the 101 conversations that we all go through if you do try and breastfeed or bottle feed. None of those conversations really should be shaped by what's in the best interest of your employer, if we're going to get yeah. this right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, every mum and I think dads too worry about whether they're getting all this stuff right I think adding on the pressure of will my employer judge me if I'm asking for help to do something and to help to do something that I think is the right thing for my child seems to be the wrong way around on the telescope but so often we expect that parents will add those layers on uh, of, of, of decision making you know and, and as I say all the trolls online have this very strong I mean my general sense is that whatever you do as a parent, you can't win. You're going to get judged. People are going to talk about you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and particularly women in the public eye like yourself, you know, that actually there's an added layer of scrutiny that nobody would particularly enjoy. And I, I, I've, I've had experiences where I've been in sort of um, public places and people will start talking to me about what I'm doing. And you kind of think, please go away. <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose for me, I found the challenge more media attention um you know my husband's a comedian and when we had our first child there were paparazzi outside our flat even though we had chosen to keep our children completely out of social media we hadn't announced that we had had a baby and i did lose it <laughs> i did lose it one day because i was you know as any new mum, i was struggling i was very sleep deprived Isla was a mess, you know, and I was determined that I was going to leave the house every day and go for a walk and take my baby out. And I remember I was, I would take her out and I used to play music on my phone because it would just calm her down because, you know, the world's quite noisy, right? You go out, there's building works, there's people shouting, there's cars, it's quite overwhelming. So I would play music and I started getting this sort of, oh, she's just on her phone while she's with a baby, you know, kind of criticisms, which I, look, right now I just laugh and go whatever I think we want at the time when you're sleep deprived and you're a new mom and you've got all these hormones and you're worrying about doing am I doing this right you know you feel so judged and there was a time when I was out and I had my baby our first our first daughter and I was you know crossing around I was all kind of tired and she was kind of wrapped up and I was just doing just you know just like anyone else just a bit of a mess if we're being honest and I saw a pap 
<laughs> clicking away. And I handed the baby to my sister who was with me and I just went and I just went a little <laughs> bit nuts on him. I was just like, do you know the pressure you're putting me under? Like, I don't want to have to look presentable. I want to have vom all over me and look like a, you know, piece of crap. I, I want the freedom to be like every other parent and look like, you know, I, I don't, I'm not someone who massively cares about the way I look publicly anyway at all, um, as you can probably tell. But, um, you know, I just had a real bit of a go at him about the pressure he was putting me under. And he actually, to give him some credence, he understood, he apologized and he didn't come back again. But that was probably the, it was probably more that spotlight. I found like in terms of people, the communities and people around, I feel like everyone was, I, maybe I was just really lucky, but I feel like I had a really good experience. I, I had, um, I, my kid finally fell asleep in the playground in a push chair and I was, had my younger and my older one and uh, a woman came up and she was like, oh, isn't that a bit dangerous? And I thought, oh gosh, what is, is something? And, and she's like, oh, you know, it's a danger nap, isn't it? I mean, it's four o'clock and I was thinking that child has been awake since four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> danger nap. <laughs> the <laughs> only danger <laughs> is that I'm going to lose it. Uh, but also, of course, what I'm really interested in, Lana, is what music were you playing your child? Because uh, to go back to, obviously, I'm desperately trying to be a cool kid DJ in my youth. You know, I, I've spent a lot of my child's early years trying to creep in in amongst the kind of Disney theme tunes, you know, Ooh, a bit of yeah. um, a bit of indie we, music, a bit of Stone Roses. I, I've got them to shout, where's my jumper? Where's my jumper? That makes me particularly proud. But what you know, do you we, judge your children's music taste more than anything? Because I know I do. Yeah, I say like we're quite sort of um, determined to indoctrinate them <laughs> with our style of music. And, uh, you know, we don't hide that, you know, we're, we have definitely since they were really small, um, played, you know, the kind of music that we love. And I'd say, you know, for those sleepy moments, there was a lot of Nick Drake and Jeff Barkley <laughs> and, you know, Leonard Cohen. Um, but, you know, my five year old's favorite band right now is Mud you know, the song Tiger Beat. And then the smaller one loves Elvis, Blue Suede Shoes, you know, Iggy, our three-year-old, she's always just like, Blue Suede Shoes, Blue Suede Shoes. So I feel like right now we've been quite successful in like curating their taste. Yeah, you, see, and also you make me feel like such a failure because because my kid is into Katy Perry. I mean, I don't know what to... If it's Coldplay, she's out. I'm sorry, I love her. I love her. <laughs> gonna go and live with the ground i can't bear it. i'm gonna tell you what we were on we were away and um we were we were away for a week with our two kids and we we had some uh child mind to come to help for an afternoon and i literally sat her down and was like so basically we're a pretty free family you know just like fun and laughter and you know you do you and you know whatever you need you take but there is one rule if you start <laughs> playing any and i gave her a list of music and i was <laughs> like it's over. It is. And she was poison in your mind. <laughs> she was laughing. And I was like, no, no, I am serious. And I was like, I was like, see, in our house, music is religion. And I was like, so there are some houses you might go into that would be religious. And there might be certain things that, you know, respect. But I was like, music is our religion. And these are the boundaries. And she was I, like, I oh, OK. <laughs> totally, totally with you. That is a proper education. Right. You know, well, you, you know what? It won't last. Stella. About everything music it won't last and the karma will be that uh, when they become pre-teens they will punish us i am sure for the right. years of us attempting to seep in with our music with some of the kind of music that we you know is our least favorite music i'm sure that's all to come and we'll have to embrace I that just then. We did what to we listen could. to music with choruses in because so much of the new stuff that's why i know i'm getting old but so much of the new stuff just there's no chorus it's the same two chords <laughs> and it's too vocoded you know uh, like and also, I, 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 managed, I did manage to teach my daughter the, the words to Mardi Bum, so she calls everybody a Mardi Bum now, which Brilliant. again <laughs> feels like it works. Uh, but she's also, and, and I guess this moves on to the sort of things that you've been involved in in terms of campaigning for kids, but my, uh, my children are very interested in the music videos. So actually, one of the reasons mm. they like Katy Perry is, to be fair to Katy Perry, she does make a good music video with you know, lots of animals in, the, 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 the song about the tiger, they like that one. Um, but they want to watch the videos. Um, mm. And one of the very hot topics that we're all talking about and thinking about, and actually one of our previous guests was Baroness B. Van Kidron, who runs the Five Rights Foundation. We were talking to her about online safety mm -hmm. um, because I don't know a parent who hasn't at some point to get five minutes peace given their child 
uh, either put them in front of a television or given them an iPad and kind of let them watch something. And certainly for my kids, watching um, music videos is one of the ways that they relax or they, they have fun and they run up and down and dance to stuff. Um, but obviously getting online is a massive challenge in the 21st century. Uh, you've got involved in the Smart Frame Free Childhood campaign. Just tell us a little bit about that and where that's coming from. What I'm really focused on is how do we take the blame, I should say, or the judgment away from parents and kids and really look at where I believe it should be, which is big tech itself and the role that governments need to play in that. Because, you know, parents face an impossible choice these days. They are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They, on the one hand, can see that there are potential harms to social media, to smartphones, you know, and the evidence for that is mounting, you know, all the time it's changing and mounting because it is a relatively new thing that we are putting these technologies in our children's hands. So the research is trying to catch up to it. So there are parents who would not want to give their children access to this until a certain age. And yet on the other hand, if they do that, but all the friends around their children are getting these, you know, WhatsApp groups going on and, you know, and they're talking on Snapchat and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're risking socially excluding your child from their friendship circle. So it's a really impossible choice. And I don't think mm -hmm. that parents should be put in that choice. You know, we don't give medicine to kids until the companies, the pharmaceuticals can prove they are safe for kids and it has to go through rigorous testing. So why are we allowing big tech companies to infiltrate our children's lives, to give them access to an, the internet, which is, you know, largely, you know, unfettered and, you know, potentially giving strangers access to our children when they haven't yet shown us and proven to us that it's a safe product for our children. And until they can prove their products are safe from these harms, why are we putting them in the hands of children? Now, I understand as a parent, right, we all are just doing the best we can, right? And I'm not here judging, you know, I am the first person to, you know, in a stressful moment, I'm trying to have a conversation, I'm juggling with my kids. Yeah, of course, you know, I might put a pepper pig on for my kid and I'm not here to say like, you know, if you ever show your child- a I have to be honest, Alana, but, but Peppa Pig is up there with me with Ed Sheeran, in <laughs> like Bluey, Bluey is the Arctic Monkeys, Peppa Pig is Ed Sheeran to me. <laughs> Mommy I get it. Yeah. Drive me up the wall. <laughs> Look, I'm with you. But all I'm saying is this is not a movement that seeks to judge parents for their choices. This is a movement that seeks to shine a light on big tech and say, why are you not proving that your products are safe and on governments to say you please can you help us look there was just a poll you know 83 percent of people this is a poll by parent kind think that smartphones are harmful to young people and 93 percent think that social media is harmful 77 percent of parents with primary school kids want to ban on smartphones under six for under 16s right you know, this is something I think we will look back one day in the same way we look at the way that cigarettes were allowed to promote themselves as healthy once upon a time. And, you know, incrementally, we started to realize the damage that they were causing. I think we'll look back at this moment with with like kind of shock that we are putting these products in our children's hands. And I think if without government legislation, they're leaving it to parents to kind of scramble around and judge each other. And it's very polarizing. And also what mm. happens to the kids whose parents really don't have the time or the resources resource to manage this right you know lucky kids who have parents who can go through their social media every night and help navigate them and all that thing great that's great for those kids but there are parents out there who don't have that privilege they are you know potentially single parents they are working extremely long hours they are struggling they've got their own struggles you know and these kids are the most vulnerable ones to the harms that we know of they are the most vulnerable and they deserve protection too and that's where i believe government legislation really needs to come into play you know, at the you moment, have ideas about what that legislation might look like. So what are the things that the campaign is calling for? Look, I think, you know, this is a campaign largely run by parents, right? We don't have all the answers. We're not the scientists and the experts doing the research. I feel like at the moment, you know, childhood should be smartphone free. We're really strong on that. And it feels like the evidence is mounting to say that under the age of 16, there are real potential harms. We know, for example, between the ages of 11 and 13 for girls, that is the most vulnerable age for them. So personally, if you're asking me, 
I think on balance right now, the legislation should be that social media and smartphones should are not appropriate for under 16s. Now, I understand there are some benefits that come along with smartphones that under 16s may benefit from, you know, things like tracking or bus tickets or getting their Ubers and things like that. But I do think that there are alternative products out there, whether it comes from, you know, retro phones, calling them retro phones instead of dumb phones, because it sounds cooler, retro phones or smart watches, there's trackers out there, you know, if there was a bit more education and understanding that the schools could help facilitate and the governments could help put guidance out about alternative products that we can use, where kids can still contact each other, you know, no one's trying to stop kids socializing and talking to each other the kids need to be part of this conversation you know here's me as a mum going i don't think kids should i i would love to see the legislation support that under 16s do you know they have alternative modes of communication whether that is the retro phones or the watches or whatever it might be or in real life right but let's involve the kids in this conversation as well because there may be things that smartphones provide to them which which are you know positive in their lives like i said like the bus tickets being on it or you know being able to be tracked by the parents but i think if you can if you can speak to those kids and we can help push forward the products that already do provide us because they do exist that there, there are alternatives out there you know no one's saying we don't want parents to be able to be in contact with their kids that's not that's not the point um it's just about going can we put the pan break on and stop giving products to kids that we know could potentially be unharmful could be harmful rather you know under the age of 18 79 percent of children have watched violent pornography not just pornography violent degrading pornography you know this was the children's commissioner's report that came out you know i don't think anyone wants their kids to, to be in that position we don't want to we don't want to have that happen to our kids, you know, and then younger kids as well. I think something like one in four kids at the age of 11 have now seen porn, you know, so it, the, the, the ranges of harms are so wide, wide ranging and the tech has developed so fast. We just need to pause. And as I said, until you can prove these products are safe for kids, stop giving them to kids, stop promoting them for kids. You know, let's, well, let's. That sounds, like, um, that sounds like something you could put in our manifesto. So obviously this podcast is I called would... the manifesto. We're on the way up to a general election. I think it's fair to say that a lot of politicians would feel that we have dealt with online harms because we've just had a piece of legislation about online harms mm. that, as I say, Baroness uh, B. Bankage, our first guest on this series, helped pioneer. It sounds like you feel there's much more work to be done. So what would you be putting yeah. in that manifesto for the general election? So look, I think for me, look, the Online Safety Act, it goes a certain way, you know, uh, but I think social media at 13 is absolutely a not evidence based. I think it needs to be 16 in terms of the evidence. That's my personal research that I've done and the experts that I've spoken to who are working in the sphere. So I think, first of all, it doesn't go it doesn't go far enough for that. I think in terms of the period of implementation, you know, I've got quite young kids, but other people need this help now. And it's taking too long for the Ofcom regulation to catch up in the implementation. So what happens to those kids in the interim? Let's actually work out what age we believe these kids can really manage some of the harms that let's be honest, we as adults struggle to manage, we find phones addictive, we get sucked in, we have mental health issues off the back of social media. And I think saying, well, this is a parental choice. It's just really unfair. It just puts so much pressure on parents. So that's in my manifesto is for <laughs> governments to do to, more. To be fair, more. I think a, a lot of people in parliament are indeed doom scrolling during some of those really long, boring meetings and boring sessions. So maybe they'll they'll catch this if you if you start talking about it online enough and perhaps parents start talking to their uh, MPs about it enough. All that, that that doom scrolling will have a positive effect in the end because it will be the conversation people need to have about how to help parents navigate what is a really difficult subject to get right. Well, given the massive history you have of activism and you're involved in this campaign. I'm sure it's one we're all going to be hearing a lot more from, but thank you so much for coming on you're and being welcome. part of the Mother Festo today. Lana, and can and I'm, I going to go, I'm going to go and scrub my Spotify to make sure that my kid hasn't managed to sneak in, you know, a bit, a bit, a <laughs> yeah. bit of, um, uh, well, no, I, I'm, I'm all right with Taylor. I can live with Taylor and I can live with Beyonce, but you know, yeah. if it's, um, Look, I and it's gone in a second, you know, um, can I also do a tiny I, I, I my... love my daughter dearly, but I am not listening to Baby Shark anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm out. I'm absolutely That's the line. Out. That's can I do a tiny can I do a tiny plug Stella for my my book as well because I have yes. got a children's book out um it's called Baboo the Unusual Bee and it's about bee with pink stripes it came out in September under Rocket Bird Books and HarperCollins um and it's all about celebrating your differences and um just sort of 
appreciating who you are and celebrating what makes you unique and special. So it's Babu the Unusual Bee. And I just wanted to plug that for me too while I'm on here. That's incredible. And the fact that you are involved in massive campaigns, you're writing children's books and, you know, you're still very, very vulnerable. Like, I think you're a pretty cool rock chick mum to me. And I'm certainly sure that my daughter would, would much rather have a mum who could write a book or perhaps string a sentence together. I don't know. Well, we're Thank all in awe of you, Stella. <laughs> Thank you for being part of the Mama Festo today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking time to listen or watch this week's Mama Festo with Yana Bird. If you're interested in the smartphone free childcare campaign, please do check out my social media where I'll be sharing the links to her campaign to find out more information and get involved in the debate about how we support children and tackle technology. And I just want to give a massive apology to Ed Sheeran. Of course, you're a national treasure, even if you're not on my playlist. Please do check out the next episode of the Mama Festo.